So here we are, not for the first time in the last three years, asking whether John Boehner will be able to survive putting on the House floor a bill that the Tea Party will hate. And here we are asking yet again whether even House Republicans who in their hearts would like to vote for that bill will decide it's in their political self-interest to vote no anyway. This is the story that led us to this moment tonight, 26 hours from a default deadline. It's the story that led us into this shutdown. It's the story that has taken us from one pointless, one destructive, one maddening episode of brinkmanship to another ever since Republicans gained control of the House. It's the story of why a sophomore Republican House member with no leadership position, with no legislative accomplishments, named Tim Hulskamp, why he can threaten, as he did today, his fellow Republicans with primary challenges, and why those fellow Republicans will take him seriously. And to understand all of this, to make sense of what seems to be an endless string of moments like this, all you really have to do is go back to one specific night, three years ago. It's the evening of September 14th, 2010, in the state of Delaware. Christine O'Donnell virtually unknown just a few weeks ago, but this morning she is officially the GOP's candidate for the Senate seat vacated by Vice President Joe Biden. O'Donnell defeated nine-term Representative Mike Castle in Delaware's Republican Senate primary. Republican primary. She's primary now the sixth Tea Party that. candidate to win a primary race this year. And I really think that day and that race is the root of everything we're living through right now of the political stalemate that has basically defined Washington for the last few years and that promises to do so all the way through the end of Barack Obama's presidency at least. That Delaware Senate race explains it all. It explains the basic nature of the Tea Party movement. It's a conservative uprising that began when, president, when Barack Obama became president, but it's an uprising that wasn't just directed at Obama and the Democrats. It's an uprising that was also aimed at Republicans. It's because of how the conservative base, how the Tea Party, chose to explain Obama's election in 2008. They couldn't tell themselves that their ideology had been repudiated by the rest of the country, that Americans had rejected conservatism and embraced a left-of-center philosophy. So instead, they came, they came up with a story that blamed George W. Bush and that blamed the Republicans in Washington who had supported him. And they're telling Bush had betrayed the conservative cause as president. He'd spent too much money. He'd attacked government too little. He'd bailed out the banks. He'd given conservatism a bad name, which left voters in 2008 desperately searching for a new direction, which led them to Obama. That's how the Tea Party retroactively assessed the Bush years, how it explained Obama's victory. And it's how the Tea Party became something of a purification movement to cleanse the party of all the sellouts who'd helped Bush, the sellouts who'd spoiled conservatism, who'd helped elect Obama. And Mike Castle, the guy who lost to Christine O'Donnell in that primary, was a textbook example of that kind of Republican. He'd been in Washington for 18 years. He'd been in politics a lot longer. He was a moderate Republican. He'd worked with Democrats. He'd voted for No Child Left Behind, the Medicare prescription drug plan. He'd voted for TARP. Mike Castle was exactly the kind of Republican the Tea Party rose up to fight. The 2010 Delaware Senate primary also explains the depth of the base's desire to purge Republicans like Castle. Here he was. He was a former lieutenant governor, a former governor, an eight-term congressman from the state's lone district. He was impeccably credentialed. And he was opposed by a gadfly with no name recognition, no money, no experience, and some incredible, obvious political baggage. I'm not a witch. I'm nothing you've heard. I'm you. None of us are perfect, but none of us can be happy with what we see all around us. I'll go to Washington and do what you would do. I'm Christine O'Donnell, and I approve this message. And that gadfly candidate who had to pay money to tell people she wasn't a witch, she won the primary. O'Donnell's victory showed that as far as the base was concerned, literally anyone was better than someone like Mike Castle, who had experience and money in the endorsement of the Republican Party. The last several weeks have been spirited, shall we say. Um, and the, uh, the voters in the Republican primary have spoken, and I respect uh, that decision. I would like to thank uh, the Republican Party for its support. Uh, I had a uh, a very nice speech prepared here, uh, uh, hoping I would win this race. The primary also explains how little the Tea Party cares about actually winning elections. Outside of the GOP base, Castle was immensely popular in Delaware. He was a general election shoe, and it was a guaranteed Senate seat pickup for the GOP. And O'Donnell was a guaranteed loser, a fringe, far-right figure in a blue state. This was obvious on primary day, but the base picked O'Donnell anyway. And, of course, she was crushed in November, and Democrats won a Senate race that they were otherwise going to lose. And that whole story, how Castle was targeted, how Castle was beaten, whom Castle was beaten by, that story is the Rosetta Stone of Tea Party-era politics. 
If you understand what happened to him, why it happened to him, then you understand everything that's going on in Washington since then, and why we're stuck in a shutdown, and why we're staring down the barrel of a debt default right now. Because the story of Mike Castle and Christine O'Donnell sums up the threat that every Republican member of Congress lives with every day. If they're judged to be insufficiently conservative, if they're judged to be disloyal to the cause, disloyal to the tribe, if they give even an inch of space on their right, then they could become the Tea Party's next target. And if the Tea Party targets you in a Republican primary, they can beat you with literally anybody. That's the lesson of Delaware. That's the lesson that lives in the office of every Republican member of Congress. September 14th, 2010, we're still living with what happened that day. And as long as we are, there's no obvious way out of the mess that is Washington these days. There are a couple ways of thinking about the Republican Party dysfunction that's at the heart of all the suspense now playing out in Washington. One is that it's just a phase, that the Tea Party uprising has temporarily paralyzed the GOP. It's helped to elect dozens of true believers, far-right, anti-government purists who pride themselves on standing up not just to the Obama White House, but also to their own party's leadership in Washington. It's also scared the daylights out of Republican office holders who aren't true believers. But they bite their tongues and they play along with the Tea Party anyway because they don't want to be its next victims. This is basically the story of John Boehner's speakership. But maybe, maybe it'll all pass. The poisonous poll numbers will take a real toll and scare some of the true believers straight. The business community, that's the party's financial backbone, maybe that will reassert itself. Maybe the passions of the base will cool off. The true believers will slowly realize they can't get everything they want if their party isn't big enough to win national elections. That is the happy ending the Republican Party establishment is hoping for. It won't happen next week, it won't happen next month, but eventually, they hope, the GOP will evolve back into a relatively healthy, relatively functional political party. But when you watch the extraordinary lengths, the increasingly extraordinary lengths that John Boehner has to go to just to do things like avert a default, and the fact that we're sitting here on the eve of a default and we're still not sure he'll actually be able to avert one, well, it raises another possibility. What if this isn't just a passing phase in the history of the Republican Party? What if we're actually living through a bigger, more fundamental turning point? It's probably worth remembering here that political parties don't have to be permanent. We think of the Democrats and Republicans as ageless, eternal entities, and they have been the two major parties in this country for 150 years now. But about the only thing either party has kept for all of that time is its name. I mean, once upon a time, there was no region more in love with the Democratic Party than the South. It was the white segregationist South. It was through a series of dramatic events in the middle of the 20th century, when Harry Truman integrated the military, when Northern Democrats pushed through a civil rights plank in 1948, when LBJ signed the Civil Rights Act in 1964. It was through a series of events like that that the white South split off from the Democratic Party. And not coincidentally, that series of events also marked the birth of the modern Republican Party. For generations after the Civil War, there was basically no such thing as a Republican Party in the South. It's because the GOP had been the party of northern liberals, anti-segregation, pro-civil rights liberals. But when those white southerners came up for grabs, the conservative movement of the Republican Party made common cause with them. And together, they changed, they shaped, and they defined the modern Republican Party. And sometimes, parties don't even get to keep their names. Sometimes they just disappear. Mentioning the Whig Party might get you a laugh these days, but it was a real deal for the generation leading up to the Civil War. It was an alliance between business interests and moralists in the North and slave owners in the South. When the Whigs sprang up in the 1830s to fight Andrew Jackson, they wanted to push for a national bank, for infrastructure improvements, for schools. They wanted the federal government to create conditions favorable to commerce. And Jackson and his party, they were the Democrats, preferred the idea of an agrarian nation. Some of the biggest names in American political history were Whigs. Henry Clay was one. Daniel Webster was one. Some young congressman named Abraham Lincoln was one of them. And there were three Whig presidents in the 1840s and the 1850s. But the coalition that built the party, the coalition that the party depended on, it wasn't stable. It became impossible to avoid the issue of slavery. And on that issue, there was just no common ground. The party fractured, and the Whigs in the North folded into the new anti-slavery party. They were called the Republicans. And the Whigs of the South became Democrats. And the Whig Party itself was then tossed on the scrap heap of history. I'm not here predicting right now that today's Republicans are going to go the way of the Whigs. But if one thing is clear right now, it's that the coalition that defines today's Republican Party isn't stable, at least not at this moment. Republicans have been the party of business for a long time. It's where they raise their money. It's where they recruit a lot of their candidates from. It's one of their favorite things to talk about. How many times have they invoked job creators these past few years? We are watching right now the interests of the Tea Party and the interests of the business community diverge. Business is terrified of a default. 
It hates the idea of even flirting with a default. It can't understand why a quixotic quest to defund Obamacare is worth linking to the debt ceiling. In the Tea Party? Well, it doesn't seem to care that much. And establishment figures like John Boehner are stumped about what to do about this. And actually, I'm stumped too, because I can't see how the alliance between business money and Tea Party populism can last. It feels like something is going to have to give. Something is going to have to give soon.